hurt to say, where have we robbed you? Right. Uh, 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 where have we robbed you? It's God. He sees everything. And he said, all right, this is, this is the Pastor A interpretation. All right, I got you. I got you. In tithes and offerings. Can it be clearer than that? In tithes and offerings. Now what you got to say, that's my answer. Hallelujah. Because where your treasure is, it shows where your heart is. Yeah, God knows your heart, but everybody else knows it too. But let me tell you about maximum life. Let me tell you about maximum life. At maximum life, we're not a church that says, bring your pay stuff. We need to check. We need to check your credibility. Do you really give 10%? No. It's an honor system. We just talked about you are our strength like no other. We just praise God with all our heart and all our soul. This is the same thing. Yes, it is. It's the same thing. Because where your money is, that says a lot. It's like people who say, I, I love you, but I don't have to tell you every day. All right, well, I, I don't know. But the people I love, I try to tell them. Because I don't know if I'm going to get another chance. And the people that I tell, I try to show them. Because I don't know if I'm going to get another chance. So even if I can't say it, you will know in a hundred ways that I love you. I don't even All I can do is smile at you. Because we're far away. Hallelujah. Even if all I can do is lift up a prayer, you may never know, but I love you. So I'm going to do something. And that's why I say where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. Hallelujah. But a lot of us wait for emotionalism. How does will a man rob God? Where have we robbed you? Play out today. It plays out like this. Pastor, you don't know. I'm in debt. Oh, I know. Like, I've never been in debt. <laughs> Anybody in the house that's been in debt, raise your hand. You all need to come, and you need to be our financial advisor. Is there one? Will there be one? All of us. The children aren't in debt. I hope oh, the children aren't, but you know what I'm saying. But it's because of tithing. So here's the testimony. I tied my way out of debt. I didn't wait till I got out of debt to become a tithing. I tied my way out of debt. Why? That didn't even make sense, Pastor. That didn't even make a bit of sense. Yes, it does. Because here's the light bulb that had to come on for me. The same discipline and love that it took to be a tither is the same discipline and love that it took for me to get off the credit card. It didn't happen the other way. The principle God was trying to teach me is that there's time and place, there's honor, and there's first and second. He was trying to teach me. And so that same lesson passed over into the rest of my life. The same way that I could set aside for the Lord is the same way I could set aside to get a house on me. The same way I could set aside for the Lord is the same way I could set aside to get a car on me. The same way I could set aside for the Lord was the same way, hallelujah, that I could be disciplined enough that they gave me a promotion. The same way I could set aside for the Lord is the same way I could set my heart to do right by my employer and I could get an award. And I had more and more to give him, hallelujah. But this is what we do. This piece of paper was the tithe. All God would say is a tenth, like this. Here's a sheet of paper. If this was ten pieces, and this is the tithe, God said, put it over here and walk with this. But here's what we do. Here's what we do. So we're supposed to have this much of it set aside for savings for someday. And this much might even be our mortgage. And this much might be our bills. So I got this to work with my shoes, my cable, my phone, etc. Et and here's what we do. We go like this. See, you see how the tide got all mixed in there? And we say, oh my, I, I, I did my shoes, I did my cable, I did my house. Where'd that tide go? Where'd that tide go? It was right here all along. Because it needed to be over there, and this is what you needed to work with. That's how it works. It's really just that simple. It really is just that simple. And when you see your budget as something that you don't put the tide in your budget, you put it over here, and then you make a budget, you will never have a problem on tithing. I, I have to tell you, because it took me a while to get this. Because I was like, how comes I can't do this? Why is it so hard? But God said, because I'm not first yet. Because I'm not a bill. Because I am not a mortgage, and I am not the gas company. Hallelujah. I am not a savings account. So that you can say, God, look what I did. Open the windows of heaven for me. I'm not your bank. I'm not a savings account. Whether God blesses me with anything out of the time, I don't care. Guess why? 
because it's not for me. It was for him because it was for somebody else, not me. It was never meant to bless me. It was meant to bless somebody because I came to this church when I needed something. I came to this church out of a place of sin. I came to this church when I was sitting home and watching TV on my couch thinking it was good enough. I came to this church and they welcomed me in. I came to this church and they gave me an opportunity to serve. I came from that same life and the people loved me. So somebody else, not me, was tithing. So I'm going to my way until these seats are filled, until there's more seats and there's another half of this church. Because somebody did it for me. person in this house, God, that you would break something open. But I thank you for wisdom, God, that as you send the increase, God, send the wisdom along with it. I thank you, God, that as you send the increase, God, you'll send the love of God, not the love of people, God, but the love of God to do some good, to let that money that comes into the hands of your people do some good for somebody that needs something money can't buy. I thank you, Lord. I bless you, God. I pray you
together, they're here right here. She's going to uh, have a special photo look. Yeah. You know, in Orlando, every time I get up to say something, whatever they ask me to do, you know, I'm just here to serve. I always say maximum life, and they say it back, right? Because it's like when you come in the building, you can always feel like that push yeah. to live a maximum life. Yeah. To live a maximum life. So I, 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 like, I always like to say that, you know, maximum life. But, uh, but this is an uh, old song that I wrote when I was just... I was just thinking about God. Like when I think about God, amazing comes to mind. Because, you know, he could have left me where I was, but he just kept me. Just be just because. It's not even a reason. I didn't give him a reason to keep me. <laughs> I gave him all the reasons not to, you know what I mean? But he just kept me just because, you know. Um y'all probably won't catch on to it. I mean, I don't know. But um, I just thank God that when my life gets complicated, he's just there and something simple that I can refer to because he's the same. Yeah. It never changes. Yeah. So it's, Jesus, you're my something simple when this life of mine gets complicated. I'm thankful that your peace surpasses all understanding. I'm grateful that when I'm weak, faith keeps me standing up by Trust in your love and your grace is more than sufficient. I can't count the gifts you give me. You're my rock, my strength, my only reason for living. And my only mission is to bring souls to your kingdom. Lord, you're everything that's right. And amazing comes to mind when I think about you, you, you. When I think about you. You, you, when I think about you, 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 when I think about you, and how you brought me through, cause you could have left me where I was, but you kept me just because, you could have left me where I was. But you kept me just because your own mercy, out of your own grace. Never will the rock cry out in my prayers. Because you're more than worthy of all of my praise. Even though I'm undeserving, you use me anyway. What manner of love is this? Where all my flaws become my stress Just to bring your people in I'm so glad you're in my life And amazing comes to mind When I think about you You, you, you when I think about you
and our relationships are not sincere and genuine anymore because we can't be real with one another and we can't be authentic with one another anymore because we have to be shallow and to get into a deep conversation with somebody makes them uncomfortable. And so we have now become programmed to make small talk with people and to be shallow in our dealings with one another. And so we have been playing mind games for too long. So that now it has become the norm. Now the church is filled with people with depraved minds. I laughed when Elder Danielle spoke of the reprobate mind when she was ministering. And so our churches are filled with people with depraved minds. And I was looking up the legal definition of a depraved mind. And the legal definition is the condition of mind described as depravity of mind is characterized by an inherent deficiency of moral sense and integrity. The Bible says this, Romans 1 28, it says, and just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to depraved or reprobate minds to, those, to do those things which are not proper. So in other words, that means that God cannot get through to us because our minds were so messed up by the culture and the environment that we, we are in that God cannot speak to us anymore. And you know how it is. And even parents have to go through this at some point when you have a knucklehead child that you try to tell them the right thing and you try to tell them the right thing and you try to tell them the right thing and they don't listen. And eventually the parent does not stop loving you. But the parent has to now step away and has to let you go through the school of hard knocks. Anybody got a degree from that school? Some of us got master's degrees. Come on, some of us got majors and minors in it. Come on, some of us, some of PhDs, amen. Come on, some of us. And so we let this depraved mindset, now we let this depraved mindset creep into every area of our life. Can I teach this morning? The mindset has crept into, it's, it, so, so we are able to compartmentalize it for our two and a half hour worship service and to pretend as if we are in our right mind for two and a half hours. Now for some people, they can't even do that for two and a half hours. Some people can't even sit in a worship service and act like they got much sense. But many of us are able to at least pretend like we got good sense in the house of the Lord. But the depraved mindset now has crept into the workplace. So now the supervisor, with your saved, sanctified self, the supervisor, the one who writes your check, they can't say nothing to you because they're going to have to deal with some consequences. If they deal with you, you're going to be a hell raiser. You're going to cause all kinds of trouble. I know I'm teaching right in here because uh, people cannot handle the truth. They cannot handle the reality anymore. In the school, the teacher might get body slammed by your bad child if they don't get what they want. I saw the child on the internet the other day, the teenager standing on the teacher's desk calling him a B, saying, I want an A. And the teacher's sitting there like, because this fool is out of his mind. Come on, you can tell when people are out of their mind. And, and so uh, we, we are in a dangerous place. In the church, we have the same kind of off thinking. I had a young lady tell me one time, you don't preach right. And if you don't start preaching right, I'm going to take everybody up out of here. Come on, in, in, in church. Come on, this, this mindset is bold in the house of the Lord. I, I, some of you might not do it that way, but you might say, I'm not going anymore because I didn't like that work. Come on, so, and, then you, and then you might get on the phone and call somebody else. Do you notice how pastor is now? I'm, I'm talking about a mindset. Come on, we, we do this stuff when we don't like things, and so we try to bring together a camaraderie or a group of people who are like Minded. Somebody say like-minded. Come on. And, and in order for us to find out where somebody's mind is, oftentimes all you have to do is look at their countenance. 
Come on, if, if you're a spirit being, and the Bible says we are spirit beings, it says we know each other by the spirit. Look at somebody near you and say, I know when your mind is off. Come on, I know when you're not right. Come on, I know when you can't look at me. Come on, in my eyes. Come on, I know something is not right in Denmark there. Come on. So in the church, we have the same kind of depraved off thinking. So much so that um, even in the body of Christ in the church, we will go where people don't need us to go. And we'll give out time and resources and we'll, we'll serve and we'll volunteer to help people out. Amen. But the church we call our own, we'll crumble up a $3 bill and put it in a tithe offering envelope and lie. Come on, walk down the center aisle. Do you know Ananias is a virus? They survived. They lied in church and died immediately. Come on, but we sit up there and we lie because our depraved mindset has tricked us, as Pastor A was saying, to think that God knows my heart. And that's enough. And then we act like it's nothing wrong with this. Look at somebody say depraved minds. I knew it would get quiet in here today. And so we say this morning to off thinking and wrong mindsets. We don't need you. Come on. Come on. Some of us ought to, ought to draw a line in the sand. Come on. Because we've been playing mind games with the enemy for too long. We've been playing mind games with people who are grasped by the devil. Amen. And we've been playing it too long and we need to be able to say, uh, I don't need you. To troublemakers and opportunists who come in our life with wrong motives. Come on, we, we ought to be able to say, I don't need you. Come on, for, to, to those who come in our life and try to build off of our reputation. Come on, to, to those who are trying to build their own kingdom off of your kingdom. Amen. Come on, you got to say, we don't need you. The reality is in the universal church that 20% of the people do 80% of the giving. 20% of the people do 80% of the giving. 20% of the people do 80% of the serving. 20% of the people do 80% of the giving, of the work. And so I'm just going to say it. I'm going to say it because it really don't matter anyway. We don't need you. <laughs> now let me say this. So I don't want anybody to be offended. But if you're offended, you're just going to be offended. <laughs> Let me say this. We don't need you, but we love you. <laughs> we, we don't need you, but we want you. <laughs> Come on. That, there's, a, there's a difference. There's a difference there. Come on. We want you here. We want you to be a part of the kingdom expansion here. We would like your support. We would like your presence. Amen. But we will not water down and we will not sugarcoat the word of God to make you feel comfortable and for the sake of filling up a seat that you sit in. Come on, we will not make you feel comfortable because as my mother would say, one monkey don't stop no show. I got Bible for it. He said, if you don't praise me, I'll get a rock to cry out for. So we just have to be honest in our relationships and stop playing mind games with people. Uh, there are many a young woman that think that they need a man in order to survive. Stop, 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 stop getting caught up in those mind games. You're going to be all right. Come on, you, you were all right before he came. Come on, it was God who kept you before, and, and now you have made him your source, and so God can't do much in your life because he's your God right now, and so God will step out of the way and let, let you do you. How many of us have had God step out of the way and let us do us? We want you sitting here, but we don't want you sitting here and not getting your mind right. We don't want you sitting here and being stagnant. We don't want you sitting here week after week and your mind is off. Amen. Because that's a danger to every single one of us in here. Come on, to, to be in the presence of people whose minds are not right. See, there's an old saying that says, one bad apple spoils the bunch. 
Come on, it's like this cancer. If a person is diagnosed with cancer, the first thing the doctor is going to say, let's cut it out. Why do we need to cut it out? Because cancer spreads. And once cancer spreads through the entire body, we're going to die. Come on, look at somebody and say, I'm not ready to die. Come on, I got too much to do. Amen. Come on, I got, I got too many things that God has promised me. Come on. And, and so I can't die. I shall live and not die to declare the works of the Lord. Amen. That's the mindset that says I refuse to fold. I refuse to break. And so God wants to do more in your life. If you agree with that, say amen. But as God begins to do more in your life, it seems as if we need more people. And, and the more you seem to rely on people who haven't had a transformed mindset, that Romans 12, the two mindset, uh, being not conformed to this world, but being transformed by the renewing of our mind. And so the more you rely on people who have not had that renewed mindset, the more puffed up the people in your life will get who are supposed to be helping you. And the truth is some people start off with the right mindset and over time as they see things progress and as they consider themselves helping you to grow, things change. And as they help you get established, they forget that you are helping them too. Come on, look at somebody and say it's a reciprocal thing. Amen. Come on, you go to work and you might help out there, but guess what? They give you a check every Friday. And so they're helping you. Amen. That's how you turn your lights on. Amen. Come on, that's how you pay your bill. Amen. Come on, never get that mindset that you are a wonder and you're doing somebody a favor. Because you got to understand that people fill out applications every day and they want your position. Come on, people call every day and they want the job that you have. Somebody shout hallelujah. But as time goes on, when you are depending on people and when people are working with you, come on, it, it, it becomes a gradual thing if people do not have the right mindset. It becomes a gradual change in their mind change in their heart. Come on, Judas didn't become a, a betrayer of Jesus overnight. Come on, he walked with him for three years. Oh, come on, I don't know how long they've been with you. Hallelujah. But every one of us knows that moment when things shift and things change. And so it was a gradual thing. And so you have got to guard your mind from that because drifting is a gradual thing. Elder Crystal taught us on last week in Sunday school about a drifting, the drifting away and how easily we can start to drift away from the things of God when you guys say you came to Bible study every week. Come on, when, when you guys say you were the first one at church. Come on, you didn't care if nobody else came to Sunday school. You were sitting right there. Come on, you, you, you didn't care. Uh, and there, there were certain things that were non-negotiables for you. But when it's a gradual drifting away, you've got to be careful that the enemy will get your mind. And so the Bible says there's a point in time, a specific time, that Satan entered into Judas' mind and heart. And so that's why we're talking about getting your mind right. Uh, because before God takes you to the places that he has for you, there are some things you need to know. There are some things you need to be equipped with. Amen. There are some revelations that he's got to give you now for your next level. And so let's be clear that the enemy is after your mind. Look at somebody and tell them the enemy's after your mind. Come on, the whole time I'm talking, amen, the enemy's after your mind. That's why you're already in battle since I said the title of the message because the enemy has already tried to get you offended and mad. Come on, the enemy has all, already tried to get you in your feelings. So, somebody ought to say amen. Now, and the truth is, if you can't handle a little title like that without getting your feelings hurt, you are in the right place today. Come on, somebody shout, I'm in the right place today. So your life will go in the direction of your thoughts. Would you agree with that? Your life will go in the direction of your thoughts. It all starts with your mind. And many Christians think that they should never ha have to hear anything but what makes them feel good. You're going to get a house. You're going to get a car. God going to bless you. God going to give you this. 
And we like that kind of message, don't we? We can, we can get off about that, you know. And check is coming on the way. Promotion is coming. And that and that that's the mindset that many Christians have now is that they want to feel good. They they want the Burger King uh, mentality word. Amen. I, I want to have it my way. And if I can't have it my way, then I'm off to the next place. And, and so many Christians think that life is all about people praising you and people telling you what you want to hear. But the times that I grew the most in my life are when I had to deal with some challenging words. The times that I grew the most in my life was when I got sat down. <laughs> Come on, no, you're not going to pray. You're not going to sing. You're not going to leave nobody in nothing. You're going to get your heart right first. Come on, th those were the times that I grew the most. Did I like it? No. Come on, because my flesh in it is contrary to, to spiritual things. And so I've got to understand when I'm going through this thing that the enemy is after my mind. And if I let my flesh control me, then he's already won the battle. Many of us want words that make us feel good. But what I need is something to help me move out of our place of infancy. I need a word that will help me move out of the place of carnality that I will live in if y'all make it comfortable for me. And so oftentimes God will set up situations in our life that cause us to be uncomfortable. And yeah, we're giving too much credit to the devil. The devil ain't got nothing to do with it. God has placed you in a hot seat because God wants to grow some foolishness up out of you. God wants to grow some silliness up out of you. God wants to grow the babiness up out of you where you cry and scream and have tantrums every time somebody confronts you on something that means that you need to grow. Come on, look at somebody say, it's time to grow up. It's time to grow up. So many Christians believe that when it comes to their mind that all they have to do is think positive thoughts and everything will work out. And the Bible tells us in Philippians 4 and 8, to let our minds think on things that are true, that are noble, that are right, that are pure, that are lovely, admirable, excellent, and praiseworthy. And so while positive thinking does have its place, simply thinking positive thoughts is not enough for you to get your mind right and to keep your mind right. Come on, you can li listen to Zig Ziglar all day long, amen. Come on, you can listen to motivational speakers all day long, but that is not going to get your mind right. Amen. Come on, it's part of the battle, but there's more to it than that. You, you, you can think all the positive thoughts you want in the world, but you better get your butt up and go to work and pay some bills. Amen. If you want to have a place to live and some light. You can think positive thoughts all day long, but if you don't study for the test and do the work that you're supposed to do, you're going to fail. Somebody shout hallelujah. That ain't something you want to say hallelujah about, but it's the truth. Come on, you can blame it on the teacher all day long, but if you don't do the work, you're not going to get the A. Amen. You can think positive thoughts all day long. You can rub yourself down in olive oil, holy oil all day long. You can speak in tongues and listen to worship music and read your Bible all day long. But if you don't take care of your body, you're going to have high blood pressure, cholesterol problems. Come on, you're going to be sick and obese. Amen. You're going to have all kinds of things, diabetes and all kinds of issues. You're not going to feel good. Your legs going to hurt. Your back going to hurt. I'm talking to somebody. Your knees going to hurt. Your head going to hurt. Come on, everything going to hurt until you realize that you have to take authority over some things in your life. Some of us think we can smoke and drink, eat like a truck driver, hang out all night, never get any rest, never exercise, and we think we're going to be well. Come on, the devil is a liar. Come on, the same way you make time to go on Facebook and, and Twitter and Instagram and Periscope. Come on, the same way you make time to do those things and to watch your favorite television show. You ought to go and do some jumping jacks, amen. Come on, you, you, you ought to go and do something, amen, to move your body and get your heart going. Amen. God heal me while you eating the sun. <laughs> I believe God's going to heal me. 
Put some more salt. Put some more ketchup on that. As a church, we can think positive thoughts all day long, but we got to have some faithful, committed givers and tithers. Amen. People who will serve. Amen. If we want to keep the doors open and the lights on. Amen. And we want things to run the way that they're supposed to run. And so the danger of positive thinking is that we believe that the positive thoughts themselves have the power to create our reality. And sure, a positive attitude and optimistic personality can open some doors for you. But is it enough to defeat the spiritual forces of darkness in your life? Come on, is your charismatic personality enough to, to, to kill the devils that are coming after your mind? Come on, is your charismatic big smile, amen, and your phony behavior, come on, up and grinning up in people's face and don't mean none of it. Is that enough to, to fight off the enemy who's after your territory and after your children and after your marriage and after your house? Y'all ain't even looking at me. Must be preaching the right word. So when Paul wrote in Ephesians 6 and 12 about spiritual warfare, he says that our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly realms. What was his solution to the problem? Did he just tell them to think positive thoughts and imagine a better reality? Did he tell them just play some soothing music and meditate and everything gonna be all right? No, he told them in Ephesians 6 and 13, he said, therefore put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you, are, you may be able to stand your ground and after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist with the breastplate of righteousness in place and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. He said, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. He says, with this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. Look at somebody saying, I'm praying for you. Praying for you. And so spiritual warfare is not necessarily about positive thinking, but it is about joining God in a battle that includes equipping yourself with the right mindset to be able to stand against the enemy. In Judges 6 and 1, our scripture text, uh, we started at 7 and 1. But it says, was it seven and one? Right. Yeah, seven and one. It says, you have too many men for me to deliver Midian into their hands. Right. And so to put this in perspective, Midian has come to the field of battle with 135,000 trained mercenaries. That's right. That's right. I mean killers, trained killers. Right. He, he comes with people who they will cut your throat. And, and they're good at it. Come on, how many of y'all watch Scandal? You know, them, they, you know them crazy guys that work with Olivia Pope? They'll take you out. He, he, he has some folk working with him. He doesn't have just a little motley crew like Olivia Pope has. He has 135,000 trained killers. This is the problem with us in the church. We just want to do whatever we want to do and we don't want to be trained. We don't think we need to be tested. Just let me do what I want to do whenever I want to do it. Come on, I'm anointed. Come on, God called me. Come on, I, I got prophesied over. Come on, come on, the prophet laid hands on me and said I had ministry over me. Come on, and so we, we, when we're not properly trained and organized like an army and we just come up and see what we, what's going to happen and who going to show up and let whoever comes do whatever they want to do, whatever they want to do it. Come on, we disqualify ourselves from the real battle. 
We disqualify ourselves from the real battle. When we're not trained, see that that's where all the schisms and isms come from in the house of the Lord. That's why people can't get along with one another. Amen. Because we're not properly trained. Because we don't have the mindset to handle or even outlast our enemies. Because the truth be told, a lot of our enemies are on another level than us. Don't even have the Holy Ghost, but they're on another level than us. Mastered some something simple things that we haven't mastered. Come on, come on. They're on another level because we don't have any discipline. Come on, military people know that you have to have discipline. Come on, military people, they understand you have to make up your bed a certain way. See, we just do any old kind of thing in church. Whatever. You don't have any discipline. In order to be effective and to be a disciple, you've got to be disciplined. That's why many Christians don't last because we don't have the proper training. And the reason we don't have the training is because we don't have discipline. And so we're never on time for anything. We come when we want to come. We do what we want to do. We got excuses for everything. I don't need amens. No discipline and we haven't sat our behinds down long enough to be trained and developed and to get the spirit of even our leadership. All right. And that's why we don't have success in the battle against the enemy. And so for many of us, we stay fighting each other. Who's going to be the big cheese? Who's going to be the greatest? The battle we're supposed to be engaged in is going on and we aren't even in it. <laughs> Fighting in church and your family members are dying and don't know Christ. Fighting about who is going to be great and we don't even realize that the enemy is tearing us up. Taking the minds of our family members. We... So Midian comes to battle with 135 trained fighters. Now here we have Gideon. Gideon's on the rise. He, he's, a, he's a charismatic new leader. And the only reason why he has this going on is because the Bible says that Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press. That's right. All right. That don't make sense, does it? He, he was threshing wheat in a wine press. He was hiding. You know, a wine press is a hidden place. He's doing something that he ought to be doing, but he's doing it in an unusual place. And for many of us, we think that the only time we're supposed to be engaged in ministry is when we're standing up with a microphone in front of us. But we have a field right in front of us on our job. We have a field right in front of us in our homes. Come on, family reunion comes and don't nobody know nothing about Jesus because we're waiting for a microphone and a platform to preach. And every day you are preaching with your life. Doing, he's, doing, he's doing what he's supposed to be doing, but he's doing it in a hidden place. And the reason he's doing it in a hidden place is because he's afraid of the enemy. Because for seven years, every time harvest time comes, the enemy comes in and takes from the people of God what they have worked for. And the reason that it is like this is because their fathers had set up a place of worship for Baal. And for other gods at a time when God had already told them, don't do that. God told them, don't worship these other gods. And so now there is a culture in their family. There's a culture, there's a mindset that says it's okay not to go to church. It's okay to sleep with people that I'm not married to. It's okay to do whatever it is that the world is doing. It's okay to live like everybody else is living. Because that's the way my father did it. And that's the way my grandfather did it. And that's the way my aunt and my uncles and them did it. And so we are we are copying off the example that we have seen. And God already told us that we aren't supposed to be living like that. Come on, look at somebody say, God told us we're not supposed to live like that. This is where the depraved mindset comes in. The depraved mindset now says that I know right, but I'm not going to do right. Come on, that's a reprobate mind. Come on, and, 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 and every single 
one of us have got to be careful for allowing that mindset to creep into us. We're supposed to love one another. But we know we're supposed to do that, but I don't like them. So I'm going to give myself a pass. And I'm going to treat them like garbage. That's a depraved mindset. Come on, we, we, we know we're supposed to be a blessing on our job. But we got the mindset of the world, and so we just do a little bit to get by. We don't really care about nothing. In reality, if the place go down, guess what? You don't have a job, dummy. But it's a depraved mindset that we have. Depraved mindset. And so God told Gideon, he said, you, I'm going to use you to shift the paradigm. He said, I'm going to use you to break down the altars of Baal that your father set up. Come on, I'm talking to somebody in here today. Where are the Gideons in here this morning? That God said, I'm going to use you to change some stuff in your family. Your family was dysfunctional before, but God's going to use you to raise up a mighty nation of people who serve the Lord. My daughter won't be living with nobody out of wedlock. Come on, somebody. Come on, I don't care what mama and them allowed. Come on, I don't care what went on before, but not in my house. Come on, somebody. Come on, come on. How, how many of us have a vision for our children to get married and be virgins? If you live in Baltimore City, you ought to pray for that. Because there's so many diseases. There's so much stuff going around that if you just go and get them birth control, guess what? You have brought into the mindset of the depraved world. The depraved system says, get on birth control pills. That'll keep you all right. But guess what? Birth control will protect you from all this nasty stuff that's floating around. Stuff that you can't get rid of. Come on, stuff that'll flare up. Amen. Come on, you take the medication, but it still flares up again. I'm talking right now. And God said, don't do that stuff because I don't want you to have to deal with the consequences of it. See, God, God is not trying to be in your business. Listen, look at somebody say, Pastor's not trying to be in your business. But I'm just trying to, under, I'm trying to get you to understand that you have bought into a depraved mindset when you start thinking just like everybody else thinks. Yes. Yes. So God used them to tear down the altars of Baal. And he did it. So as a result, there's an anointing on his life. There's an evident anointing on his life. When God begins to use you, people see it. Come on, when, when, when God uses you, when God starts to raise you up, God sees you. Come on, God, God, God shows you to people. Amen. Come on, he begins to elevate you in the eyes of the people. And so this is what God was doing for Gideon. There was clearly an anointing on his life. And so God took him and all his insecurities. I forgot to tell you that Gideon really wasn't some clever person for, for, for threshing wheat in a wine press. He did it because he was scared. That's right. <laughs> Come on, how many scared people do we have in here that know that God has a call on our life? And we think we can do what we do in hiding, amen. But God said, come out from among them. Come on, be separate, amen. Come on, I got something to do for you. And the gift of God that's on your life, when you really let God use you, you can't hide it. You can't hide it. You cannot hide it. And so God uses him. He uses him. All his insecurities, all his issues. And God says to somebody in here this morning that I want to use you with all your issues, with all your insecurities. Come on, I don't need you, but I want you. Come on, I don't have to have you. Come on, it's a gift. It's a gift of salvation that I'm giving to you. But if you don't want to take it, then fine, don't take it. Come on, he said don't take it, but I'll use somebody else if you won't do it. In other words, God said one well, look, you don't stop no show. Come on, that's biblical there. Amen. God, God said, I will use somebody. He said, even if I have to use a donkey. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. So I was submit when there's an anointing on your life, Gideon found out that the anointing becomes evident to other people. And not only does the anointing become evident to other people, the anointing attracts all kinds of people. Oh, come on. All kinds of people, all kinds of people. The 
the anointing attracts all kinds of people, all kinds of people with different motives, amen. Come on, folk want to hang out with you because you dress nice. And they figure, oh, if they can hang out with you, they can find out where you shop. Come on, I'm talking about the sh shallow, stupid stuff we attract ourselves to people with. Come on, because you got a nice car. Come on, they, they want to hang out with you and find out the secret to your success. Come on, because God blessed you with something. Come on, because God is using you mightily. Folk want to get attracted and come on and then find themselves all up in your face. So Gideon begins to draw a crowd. Come on, I'm talking to people in here now who once you came out of the wine press, come on, once you came out of hiding, come on, once you got your, uh, you, you did your initial sermon, amen, come on, once they saw on Facebook, hallelujah, you posting scriptures, amen, come on, you came up out of hiding, amen, and now people see the glory of God on your life, and it begins to attract the crowd. But the Bible says he was only able to muster up 32,000 men. That sounds like a lot, doesn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. But not very good odds when you look at what the enemy had. For many of us, we sit there and we're counting up what the enemy's working with versus what God has blessed us with. Come on, and I, and I come to tell somebody in here today that quantity does not all is not always better than quality. Amen. Come on. Take quality over quantity any day. Come on, I, I take one good friend than rather have ten phony friends. Come on, I, I take I take five good church members than rather have a thousand phony. Come on, come on, I, I take I take seven good ministers and elders and deacons. Come on, than rather have a whole row of people in collars that are cutting each other's throat. Come on, and sleeping with each other and don't care nothing about the ministry. Come on, I'd rather have one person up here leading praise and worship with the right spirit than a bunch of people who got a Lucifer spirit who want all the attention and all the glory to come to them. Come on, we gotta be careful when we start drawing crowds. Tell my children all the time, be careful who you hang out with. Be careful who you hang out with because you are anointed and you are blessed. And sometimes when you are anointed and you are blessed, people come smiling in your face, but their only intention is to destroy you and to sabotage you. And they smile and grin in your face. And when you walk away, they are sowing seeds of discord because they can't stand the anointing that's on your life. But I'm excited because David said he prepared Don't need you. We don't need 
you. Come on, God has revealed to us in the spirit whose team you're on, and you're not on our team, and we don't need you. Not interested in a bunch of seat fillers, but I need some folk that will catch hold of the vision. Come on, I don't need seat fillers. You know, you know on the Academy Awards that they pay people just to sit in a seat so that none of the seats are empty, and so they give them a little. You know, a little like minimum wage kind of amount. It's people just like us who don't nobody know. They pay us ten dollars an hour just to sit there and to look good, so so the seat won't be empty. And I, I would declare that we got too many people in church who are the equivalent of a seat filler. It costs more to have you here than it does to not have you here. Come on, the hell that you cause, the confusion that you cause. Come on, the contrariness that you cause. We don't need you. Y'all, I'm, I'm almost done. Give me a few more minutes. So 135,000 to 32,000. And so once we hear that, God is, Gideon is God's man, right? He's God's man, you know. God, God placed him in position. And so we, we, I, I, I expect God to come to Gideon and say, look Gideon, you don't have enough workers here. It don't look like you can handle this battle. Uh, let, let, let's do some more recruit, recruiting. Come on, God, God, let's do this for you. How many of us have an anointing on our life and we know that God has told us to do it and we open the doors and we're like, where they at? <laughs> I'm going in business. I got my cards printed up. Come on, I know the phone gonna ring off the hook. And then we like, where they at? Where they at? Where they at, Lord? How come, you know, we, we, we do what God told us to do. We write the play, come on. We write the book, amen. We do what it is that God told us to do. And even the people who call themselves our friends don't even support us. So we might expect God to come to Gideon and say, you don't have enough here, uh, let me help you out. Let me see if we can get another 100,000 people to join your cause so it can be fair game. Come on, what do we think God would say that? But God doesn't. Instead, the Lord makes one of the most confusing statements to me in all of the Bible. He looks at him and he sees him like looking like the underdog in the situation. Come on, looking, looking like Steve Urkel up against Arnold Schwarzenegger. Come on, he looks like he can't win in the situation. And God says, instead of, instead of God saying, I'm going to get you some more people, God says, you still have too many men. See, I, I'm saying this to God. I'm saying like, God, you know, uh, we don't have a mega church. God, you really want me to preach something like this? God, you really want, to look, want me to look at people who are quick to have attitudes because they're in the flesh half the time anyway. You want me to look out at them and say, we don't need you? God, God, we just, we, we got a small church, God. God, you really want me to say something like that? And God said, yep, I want you to say it because you got to understand that there's a reason for me decreasing your crowd, decreasing your circle. is because everybody that says they're for you is not for you. And so I'm going to do some separating I'm going to do some. Since so you got too many men for me to deliver Midian into your hands. In other words, in God's eyes, God is saying, Gideon, you have too many resources for me to move. God, God you, and he's like, what? This is a trained military. God, you know what I got. Come on, some of us are thinking about our bank account right now. You say, what? We thinking about the team that we got, the, the people working with you or working against you? I told my husband this morning, I don't think I want to preach. I didn't tell him what the message was. I said, I don't want to preach today because I don't think nobody's going to like me. And he said, hmm. I said, he was looking and said, hmm. And, I, and then the Lord said to me, guess what? The ones who matter won't mind and the ones who mind don't matter. Many times we find ourselves depending on people to help us and people to help get us out of a pinch that we're in. And one of the most devastating realities for, for me and for many of us is to find out that the people we expected to be there 
for us are nowhere to be found when we are in the heat of the battle. And so God tells Gideon, you have too many people. Look at somebody near you and say, you have too many people. Come on, I don't know about you, but as God began to speak to me this week concerning people, I told my husband as I was saying, I'm not sure who I can depend on anymore. We were going somewhere last night and I looked at him almost with tears in my eyes and I said, I don't know who's on my team anymore outside of the Lord. I said, I'm not sure anymore who's with me and who's against me. And that's a very challenging place to be, but God said, baby, I got you. That's a good place to be. Because he says, in your weakness, I'm made strong. Come on, he said, stop trusting horses, stop trusting men, but I will trust in the name of the Lord. Give me five more minutes. Like Gideon, some of you today are probably thinking to yourself, how could God tell me that I need to let some people go? I already don't have anyone to depend on. Some single mother in here, you're already struggling to make ends meet. And, you, and, and God would send a word for me to look at people and say, I don't need you. Some, some men, I look at my husband, I look at somebody who ever since I've known him for 25 years, he's worked seven days a week and he never complains. And I think about the fact that God, I say it all the time, thank God I'm not a man. I thank God all the time and he looks at me and he says at different times of the month, thank God I'm not a woman. So God made us both what we're supposed to be. But I think about what fathers go through. Think about the weight. Now sit down, now sit down. Y'all making me nervous. I think about the stress. And I think about the burden that fathers have to carry. Husbands have to carry. To provide for people who don't even say thank you. Sometimes we just forget to say thank you. Sometimes we don't realize the burden. Now think about the fact, I'm not sure when he bought a new pair of shoes and his birthday is coming up November 16th. And I said, we're going to bless him maximum life. Sacrifices, and there's so many of us in here today, and, and we don't have time to all tell our story. But to hear a word that says we gotta let some things go so that God can be strong in our life, that is a hard word to hear, but it's a reality that God told me to speak to you today that you are relying on too many props, and God is removing the props from your life, and it might be painful, and then you might not understand it, and you might to hold on to people, but I come to tell you they don't stalk another person. Don't beg another person to stay in your life. Don't beg another person to love you. Don't beg another person to validate you or to support you. Don't you, don't you dare go after somebody who wants to walk away from you. If they want to walk, then let them walk and let God send you who he's going to send you because I believe we are at a time of great and we will be obedient to the voice of the Lord. Thank you. We don't need you. I want you to get that in your spirit. Not in a rude way. There's a lot of love in it. It's a lot of love in it. It's, first of all, it's self-love. The Bible says that you cannot love somebody else more than you love yourself. You gotta love yourself first. Come on, you gotta love yourself first. You gotta love your neighbor as yourself. You don't love yourself, how you gonna love me? And this is the problem we find ourselves running into. First commandment is love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind. Is that mind? Don't play mind games with yourself another week. Don't, don't, don't try to 
rationalize holding on to stinking thinking. Because he got, got told Gideon, he said, I'm not going to have you do it. He said, I'm going to do it. See, see, this, 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 this frees you from having to call and break up with anybody. God will do it. For many of us, God has been trying to do it, and we keep stepping in and getting in the way. God, God's been trying to break up that thing for a long time. I'm talking to somebody prophetically in here. He's been trying to break up uh, dysfunctional relationships. Come on. He's been trying to break up bad habits that we have, and we keep going back to it again. Even things as simple as drinking soda. Do you know how many calories one soda is? If you drink seven of them a day, you are, you are taking in thousands of calories. All the calories you need to be eating, you are drinking. In a soda. Because of the sugar. Not only that, the acid in the soda, you know what that does? It stretches your stomach. And so your stomach gets bigger and bigger. And that's why, you remember, I remember the first time I had uh, a Whopper, a Whopper from Burger King. I couldn't eat it. But as I began to eat it more and more and more, I could eat the whole Whopper and then I wanted a pie. I ate the whole Whopper, the french fries, a pie, a whole soda. I went from a medium soda to a large soda because I'm steadily stretching my stomach. I'm, I'm, I'm saying this, and if you hear me spiritually, this is what we do in the spirit room. The depraved mindset is a gradual thing. And the things of this world stretch us. Where our desire for the things of the world become greater and greater. I'm not finished. This is going to be a part two and a part three because I want to talk about how God separates the men from the boys. I'm going to talk about how God separates the real deal from the false ones. And so I want everybody to stand. I pray you got something out of the word on today. But God is, he's, he's, he's with us. He's with us. He's with you, Gideon. Come on, with all your insecurities, with all your fears, God is with you. Yeah. Come on, look at somebody near you say, he's with you. He's with you. God, God looked at Gideon, he got spoke to Gideon and said, you mighty man of valor. <laughs> what have you been allowing the world to call you? I'll take what God calls me yeah. over what the world calls me. Yeah. Anyway. So that's why in order to renew your mind, you got to renew it in the word of God. The washing of the word of God. And so if you aren't opening up your Bible, I encourage you, I challenge you today to stretch. Look at somebody say, stretch, stretch, stretch. Some people say, well, Pastor, I don't know what to do when I open my Bible. Just open it and read what we talk about on Sunday. Read what we talk about on Wednesday and ask God to give you revelation. Don't read the whole Bible. Just take that one verse. Come on, take two verses and just study on it and just meditate on it. Just lay there and let God speak to you because oftentimes we think prayer is just us talking. That's not, all, that's not the whole part of prayer. The other part is to shut up and listen. Because God definitely has something to say to you. Look at somebody say, God has something to say to you. So right now, we just lift our hands right where we are. God, we need you. God, we need you. Come on, just open up your mouth and say, God, we need you. We, we know you don't need us, but we need you, God. We know you don't need us, God, but we thank you because you chose us. We thank you, God, because you love us. Come on, come on, grateful people. Open up your mouth and thank you. Thank you for choosing you. Come on, thank you for loving you in spite of you. 
Come on, thank him, hallelujah, for picking you up out of the muck and the mire. Come on, thank him, hallelujah, for pulling you up out of the place of depravity that your mind was in. Thank you, thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We bless you. Come on, Zion, open up your mouth. Open up your mouth and talk to him. Come on, open up your mouth and talk to him. Come on, open up your mouth and talk to him. Come on, open up your mouth and talk to him. Come on, just say thank you. If you don't know what else to say, say thank you. Say I love you. Say I appreciate you. Come on, right now we pray, God, that you cover our minds, God. We pray, God, that you give us revelation, God, like never before, God. Renew our minds. Renew our thinking, God. Change our own mindset, God, and cause us to think like you would have us to think, God. Give us the mind of Christ. God, we thank you and we praise you, God. We thank you, God. We ask for your forgiveness, God, for anything that we have done to offend you, God. We, we, we ask for your forgiveness, God, for anything that we have done, God, to, to bring shame to your name, God. We thank you and we praise you, God, that you're still calling our names. You're still calling our names, God. Even in our sin, God, you're still calling our names, God. We thank you that you didn't give up on us, God, but you keep calling our name, God. We love you, God. We adore you, God. We worship you, God. We call upon you, God. We need you, God, like never before, God. Order the steps of your people, God. Order the steps of your people, God. Give us hearts that pant after you, God. And we'll be careful to give your name, the praise, the glory, and the honor that is due. Come on, clap those hands and give God a mighty round of applause. Come on, give God a mighty round of applause. consistently as much as possible Wednesdays, Sunday, Wednesday 7.30 Sunday 10.15 a.m. Um, you're coming all the time because you have a heart for God and you want to know more about who he is. Which leads to the second level. The second level, I believe, is the heart to serve. You're coming consistently and you're like, okay, I want to be a part of what's going on here. I want to help move this kingdom forward. They need ushers, I'll usher. They need a deacon, I'll deacon. They need somebody to play an instrument, I'll play an instrument. Because you have a heart to serve. Then, after serving, you have the heart for God, and you're serving your heart to serve, you get to the third level, which is the heart to give. The reason why, the 
reason why I say that's the third level, because giving is hard for, for many of us, especially, you know, our finances. It's like, no, it's my money. I ain't, what? What? Those new, shoes come, no new, no new shoes come out next week. I need my money, you know? And I feel like giving is the hardest for us. So that's why I say it's the third level. You have to have to mature to that level. So my prayer today is that God will elevate you from whatever level you're on. Whether it be the first level or the second level. Or maybe it's a If you just have a curious heart, just if you're here today because you want to know who God is and uh, what, his, what his house is all about. And that's a great start. But I also here to encourage you that through faith, you can skip a level. Because you can be on the first level and skip to the third level through faith. Because even though you might not have, you know, might not be serving or have the understand everything, but your faith in God will elevate you from the first level to the third. And I encourage you all to walk on faith today and give. Um, I actually had a scripture. I'm trying to be brief before you all had a, had a scripture. I was meditating on a scripture all week. I thought I would share a little bit with you. The wicked, I'm reading from Psalms 37 and 21. The wicked borrow and don't pay it back, but the righteous are generous in giving. Those blessed by God will possess the land, but those cursed by God will be cut off. A person's steps are made secure by the Lord when they delight in his way. Though they trip up, they won't be thrown down because the Lord holds their hand. I was young and now I am old, but I have never seen the righteous left all alone, have never seen their children begging for bread. They are always gracious and generous, their children.